Hi, my name is Joseph Jones. I'm a forensic toxicologist and consultant with Pinpoint Testing. And uh, for today, I get the joy of getting to talk with you about the role of the toxicologist and certain key points that I feel are necessary um, for you to understand about your toxicologist and how you can hopefully have success with a toxicologist in the courtroom. And so today, specifically, we're going to start off by talking about the role of a toxicologist. What role do they play in your court? What can a toxicologist do for you? And also, what can they not do for you? Secondly, we're going to talk about terminology. Believe it or not, scientists often have terminology that's going to be different from the officer testimony uh, that is going to be presented. And then third, we're going to talk about the important issue affecting today, which is drug tolerance. And that's going to be a common defense that comes up for you to deal with. And then lastly, we're going to discuss specimen choice. What's the ideal specimen? What does the specimen really mean? and hopefully uh, you'll be able to have a good understanding. So first I want to discuss with you the role of the toxicologist. The toxicologist specifically, what can they testify to? What can they not testify to? And then we'll dig into some of those terminology terms. What can a toxicologist, whether it's a state, a local toxicologist, or someone involved with the case do for you, for, for you in a courtroom? Number one, they can testify to the analytical documentation. What does that mean? That's the actual chain of custody, any type of evidence handling that occurred within the laboratory, how they actually go about testing a specimen um, in their laboratory, their case flow and approach, but also something that is easily overlooked is what does the lab really test for? Is a drug that perhaps was consumed in the testing menu? And they can also talk about the keys of limits of detection, the scope of analysis. Another thing a toxicologist can help you with is understanding drug names. Drug names that are scientific, but also drug names that are common trade names. And then general indications if that toxicologist knows what those are. A toxicologist additionally can provide you with useful references for therapeutic drug concentrations, the intended effects, and why a drug might be abused. Now, we have to be really, really careful with therapeutic um, concentrations and drugs. There's a lot of useful references. Most prosecutors I know love Winnix charts. There's also great um, uh, information with the International Association of Forensic Toxicology. But it's very important with all of these that we, we compare apples to apples. And what I mean by that is that a lot of the studies that you see for therapeutic concentrations involve single dose or steady state doses of drugs. And often they were done with plasma and not whole blood, which is what you have in forensic specimens. And so as I tell prosecutors, be very careful with interpreting therapeutic drug concentrations and make sure that you have uh, an apple in an apple. One of the most uh, common things that are not uh, used in a courtroom are actually FDA package inserts from drugs. A good example, and one of my favorites, is the uh, package insert for diazepam or Valium. Did you know that the package insert, which every uh, pharmacist provides with their prescription drugs um, that they dispense, says that diazepam should be reduced by at least one-third whenever it is used alongside with a narcotic analgesic, a drug like oxycodone or hydrocodone, that that should be reduced by at least one-third and administered in small increments. And then the common statement that's particularly um, common with all of these drugs is that be careful whenever you are operating heavy machinery or driving a motor vehicle whenever you start using these drugs. Second thing I want to talk about today is the number. Uh, perhaps the most common question is what does a number associated with a drug mean and how to, can it be interpreted towards impairment? And this is often a hard thing for me to say and it's hard to hear but what I would advise you is to not get fixated on that number. What do I mean by that? Well, in some states, urine numbers are very, very highly valued, but urine numbers cannot be traced back to impairment. I have had it described to me that urine really is something more of an indication of prior use. Blood, maybe that's more like a picture in time, but urine, at best, it can only indicate prior use. For blood concentrations, though, you have to be very, very um, uh, careful that you define therapeutic 
blood concentrations. I think a better question to ask, ask a toxicologist is, is the concentration in a blood sample within the therapeutic range? That's something we can find uh, results for. That's something you can find in a chart. But whether or not it's therapeutic for an individual, a toxicologist isn't going to be able to help you with that. But something that might be conflicting is that there's not a clear correlation between blood concentrations and impairment for really any drug. And I'll qualify that. What I'd like to tell you is that for the most part, we have studies, and there, science has done studies on drugs individually. However, more than likely your case, more than likely most cases, they involve a drug plus something else. More often than not, we call those polydrug cases, and that's whenever we have a drug plus another drug plus another drug, and probably that drug was washed down with alcohol too. And so those are where cases where we have to be very, very careful and know that science isn't going to ever be able to go find a human study where we did to another human being what your driver did to themselves. An individual, though, and this is important, they may not be impaired if the concentration is above the therapeutic range. This happens a lot whenever an individual becomes tolerant. But an individual may be impaired if the concentration is within or sometimes even below. Highly subjective results and highly dependent upon the individual. What can a toxicologist not do for you? Well, really, they can't answer the ultimate question. Is the driver impaired? There's no clear correlation between blood drug concentrations and impairment for most drugs. You cannot compare alcohol concentrations to drug concentrations. You cannot predict drug concentrations at an earlier time. All of these aspects are things that are individually known to a person. We have got over 50 years of alcohol research, and our alcohol research is good. But for drugs, what we've been able to determine is that human beings just don't operate like each other. Some individuals are fast metabolizers. Some individuals are slow metabolizers. And you don't know. That's why it's so important to, to look at officer observations. Toxicologists also can't answer what drug symptoms would be expected in the individual defendant. That is a question that they weren't there they do not know, and they specifically do not know how that individual would react. A better question maybe would be, generally speaking, what indications would a drug present like in a person whenever it's taken? And then lastly, a toxicologist is not going to be able to tell you whether or not a dose was appropriate um, that was provided. Once you get a toxicologist in court, what do they bring? more than likely they're going to bring with them the administrative documents. What is that? Original case records, chain of custodies, lab reports. Perhaps you need a certified lab report. And in that case, a toxicologist will bring those. Analytical documentation, if it's required. These are often very, very cumbersome and voluminous, but they can provide you with those as well. Some states require the physical evidence be brought to court if it wasn't destroyed. And so a toxicologist can, ble can bring the blood or the urine specimen uh, with them. They'll also bring any other pertinent material um, that you might need. And what do I mean by that? They'll bring their resume or their CV, permits, um, and any sort of accreditations that their laboratory might have. Now, we also discussed that one of the differences that you have with toxicologists um, and your officers is often terminology. And so I want to talk a little bit about terminology and make sure that everyone understands the differences. In general, whenever we talk about pharmacology, I describe those as the PK and the PD. And what I mean by that is that pharmacology is divided into two sub-areas. One is called pharmacokinetics. Pharmacokinetics are what the body does to the drug. Pharmacokinetics might be your toxicologist's biggest strength in court. Your toxicologist works in a laboratory environment. They know how a drug gets metabolized in the human body. They know typically observed concentrations. And they know what that body does to a drug, probably better than most people. There's also a sub-element of pharmacology called pharmacodynamics. 
And that's what the drug does to the body. This is a big limitation for toxicologists, but it's perhaps the, the biggest strength of your officer or drug recognition expert. They are specifically trained and spend the vast majority of their careers observing what drugs do to the human body. And so don't forget to use your officers because they really are the experts. Pharmacy also is a health profession tasked with enduring safe and effective use, not related to toxicology or, pharmacy or pharmacology. And then toxicology can be defined as what happens whenever pharmacology goes bad. Another important element in terminology is, is impairment versus intoxication. Impairment defined is the deterioration of judgment, attention, or loss of fine motor skills. Sometimes it can be an increased reaction time in the case of stimulant use, or it could be a decreased reaction time uh, in the case of a depressant use. There's almost always some type of diminished sensory perception, but this is very, very important that an individual can be impaired without gross physical signs. That gross physical sign is what's commonly called intoxication. And intoxication is an advanced stage of impairment. That's whenever you see those commonly, uh, I, I describe them as camera-worthy events of a gross physical intoxication and stupor. Impairment becomes intoxication, but this is key, that intoxication and impairment are both very unique to the subject, and it depends upon an individual's tolerance. And then there's also visible and invisible signs. A subject can be impaired without visible signs. Don't forget that.